Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel. Douglas McGregor asserts that to get an answer from someone in a position of authority in Washington, you would need to consult all the individuals who helped promote that person. This ensures that the response aligns with what those influential figures want them to say. In 1942, after the fall of Tilbrook around June or July, the British had endured two long years of defeats by the Germans. Despite often outnumbering their enemies, the British suffered continuous losses. Following the major blow at Tilbrook in North Africa, someone asked Churchill if they were losing the war since they hadn't won any battles. Churchill acknowledged the importance of battles, but emphasized that in modern warfare, trends decide wars, and the trends favored them, not the Germans, urging patience. Similarly, while the Russians had a slow start for various reasons, they haven't sustained any serious defeats. Currently, they are defending annexed territory and preparing for major offensives in November and December. Additionally, the 300,000-man mobilization is complete with those reservists now integrated into the Russian armed forces and undergoing preparation and training. The mobilization has not been suspended, and there's substantial evidence that decisions have been made behind the scenes to continue it. Instead of 700,000 Russian troops in November or December, there may be a million by January. This is because Putin, his national security advisors, and military commanders are responding to threats and demands for his surrender to Zelensky, which isn't going to happen. Regarding to the first question, this can be seen as a trial balloon. Petrius was given material to gauge the American people's response. Unfortunately, there is serious planning about using U.S. forces in Ukraine, which is dangerous and ill-conceived. The mention of a coalition of the willing reveals that NATO is not united on this issue. Most Europeans are not interested in being dragged into a war with Russia. The coalition might consist of Romanian, Polish, and perhaps Lithuanian troops, but it's uncertain who else would join. The British likely couldn't field 10,000 to 15,000 competent troops quickly, and the French are already overextended in Africa. Thus, this coalition of the willing is another indicator. Finally, why is this even being discussed? Ukraine is devastated and on the brink of extinction. Initial counterattacks, which began with 30,000 to 50,000 troops, have dwindled to 3,000 to 5,000, and recently, Battalion-sized units of 500 to 700 have attempted to penetrate Russian defenses. Ukraine is running out of manpower. Information suggests that Polish soldiers in Ukrainian uniforms, estimated to number over 10,000, along with a foreign legion, which may number 5,000 to 7,000 or less, are the only formations with a resolve for serious attacks. In Washington, there are individuals who seek a direct confrontation with Russia believing they can bully and compel Russia to submit, allowing Zelensky to accept their surrender. This notion is bizarre, unsupported by evidence, dangerous, and foolish, yet it characterizes the thinking at the top. The reports indicate there are about 5,000 troops, consisting of a mix of light infantry and 60 aircraft. It's unclear if they have a battalion of 64D attack helicopters, but they are supposedly working with Romanian forces. This appears to be part of the coalition of the willing. While the rest of the division is stationed in Poland, several hundred miles north, rumors suggest they might fly into Odessa to set up a blocking position to prevent Russian advances and wait for reinforcements. However, the idea seems implausible, as Odessa is a Russian-speaking city that Russia intends to reclaim, along with Kharkov. Such an operation likely wouldn't end well for the United States and its coalition. The question then arises, if heavy casualties are sustained and the coalition is seen as losing, will nuclear weapons be considered? There has been no indication of interest in nuclear weapons from the Russian side, except in response to potential nuclear attacks. The danger lies in inadvertently escalating the conflict project, a point emphasized in a recent op-ed. We're not ready. This situation is like a get-set-and-go scenario, whether we're prepared or not, and we're not. The infrastructure isn't there, the ammunition supply is insufficient, and the force sizes don't make sense. 
while the Russians made mistakes when they went in, at least they had the goal of avoiding killing fellow Orthodox slaves. That goal didn't work out as hope, but they had guidelines. In contrast, we have no such constraints, and we lack the necessary forces. The Russians are building their forces for a reason this area is the size of Texas. Without several hundred thousand troops, it's impossible to dominate it. How are we going to do this? This possibility is now more likely than a nuclear exchange. Although it's hard to quantify the likelihood minus 90%, 80%, 60%, the information received from insiders confirms that the concerns are valid. Since FDR, we've lived in a world of presidential government, which is one of the tragedies of United States. They are primarily interested in gauging any public reaction. Those in power in Washington are used to a compliant public. It's rare for people to protest actions taken overseas by the American military. The last significant opposition was during the Vietnam War, and even then, it took years before people took to the streets. The notion that the draft was the cause of the protests isn't entirely accurate. It took three years before any substantial objection to the Vietnam War emerged. Most Americans on any given day are not particularly interested in foreign interventions. As a result, the current administration's leaders are acting recklessly like three-year-old children, discovering electrical sockets and poking forks into them to see what happens. This behavior is dangerously foolish, akin to pushing a fork into an electrical outlet. The only significant territory loss has been near Kharkov, where they had just 2,000 paramilitary police supported by some paratroopers. They decided the open flat terrain wasn't worth defending and pulled out with plans to return whenever necessary. The Ukrainians who moved in were then subjected to heavy artillery rocket fire missiles and airstrikes, losing 40% of their forces. In recent weeks, small maneuvers and attacks have occurred, pushing forward briefly before being driven back. The real focus is Kherson, crucial to both Russians and Ukrainians. The Ukrainians have made every effort to gain control, but haven't driven the Russians off the bridgehead west of the Dnieper River. Russia Reports often misunderstand the situation Russian civilians were evacuated to prevent casualties, just as Ukrainians evacuated their civilians. However, there has been no significant withdrawal of Russian forces. The modest gains by the Ukrainians have generally been reversed, or there has been no urgency to counter them. Behind the front lines, there are well-equipped Russian forces of 50,000 to 80,000 men training in southern Ukraine, western Russia, eastern Ukraine, and Belarus. Evidence suggests U.S. preparation for three major offensives involving hundreds of thousands of troops. Their focus is not on a few kilometers of open flat terrain. The areas currently under Russian control have received significant quantities of food, medicine, and humanitarian assistance, which were badly needed. Numerous engineering organizations are working to rebuild towns, villages, and farms destroyed in the war. Most people in these areas consider themselves Russian, and there has been no reported friction, even from foreign journalists who are not Russian. This situation is not comparable to World War II when Polish, White Russian and Ukrainian populations often wanted the Germans to return within 24 hours of Soviet liberation. The current circumstances are very different, making it a mistake to draw comparisons with World War II. Beyond this, details are limited since he has not been there. As for the winter, unless Greta Thunberg can stop its onset, it will be extremely cold in that part of the world. Having been there, he knows it's very cold in the winter. Those areas will get colder first since they are flat, open steppes with vast fields lacking anything to retain heat. The cities and tiny villages in between cannot hold the heat, and fuel is a significant problem for the Ukrainians. They are already withdrawing their tanks and armored fighting vehicles due to a lack of fuel, now relying on pickup trucks equipped with heavy machine guns or automatic cannons. This is mentioned in the op-ed as technicals. The electrical grid is down, causing railway disruptions, except where diesel engines are used, which are also being targeted and likely to be destroyed soon. 
this severely impacts Ukrainian mobility in the wide open spaces. Hopefully, someone will recognize the urgency of arranging peace talks to end this conflict. Reflecting on past experiences, it's clear that prolonged military engagement isn't always sustainable. For instance, in 2005, he advised against staying in Iraq, predicting that the situation would not improve. Despite concerns that leaving would make Iraq a platform for terrorism, the Iraqi army, built up at great expense, eventually fell to ISIS forces and pickup trucks. Now, the same advisor who insisted on staying in Iraq is suggesting a feasible strategy in Russia.